This vacuum tube is a 304 TL. It has a maximum plate dissipation of 300 watts. Therefore the 300. The 4 supposedly comes from because there's 4 plates. There's also 4 grids for filaments. There's no cathode. The filament is the uh, cathode. This was a, a very early wartime concoction that was put to great use during World War II. And the reason there's four, like a four-leaf clover, is because all they did was take this much older vacuum tube and put four of them in one glass envelope. The 75TL has a maximum plate dissipation of 75 watts. You can just sort of make that out there. 75 watts. When you put four of them in a configuration like this, and you have a tube that's capable of dissipating 75. It has a plate dissipation of 300 watts. Now the 75TL also had a directly heated cathode. That is, the plate came out the top of the tube, the control grid came out the side of the tube, and two pins in the base, there was a four pin base, were connected to a filament. In the 304 TL, we have a plate comes out the top. Grid connection comes out the side. Very early versions had actually a metal ring around here. And then a connection to the ring. Interestingly, this tube has a filament that requires either 5 or 10 volts at either 25 or 12 and a half amps. The reason that's possible is because electrically it has one plate. Well, actually it has one plate manufactured as four. It has one grid. Hard to see, but that see the grid comes in the side here, turns vertically, right dead center under the plates, on the center line of the tube. And then it fans out on a four sided structure, a thin metal plate that goes to a small circle four times, picking up the four grids. However, the four filaments that came from the 75TL are grouped in two pairs. This is a pair of filaments, and this is a pair of filaments. The 75TL originally had a 5-volt filament at six and a quarter amps. Two filaments are connected in parallel here, which gives us a filament voltage of five volts at six and a half amps. And two are connected in parallel here. 
So these pairs then, all four filaments, the second half is two filaments connected in parallel here. So these filaments all taken together can be connected in series, four filaments in two pairs, connected in series with two pairs, or parallel, all four filaments in parallel. Well, all four filaments in parallel is 5 volts at 25 amps, or 10 volts at 12 and a half amps. They literally took four 75 TLs and put them in one tube. Typical operation has plates at 1,500 to 3,000 volts. Now this is for dual tubes. Single tube, 2,000 to 2,500 volts. Plate current of between a quarter to 0.4 amps was used in early versions of a pulsed radar system. In amateur use, these were a dime a dozen. You could easily get, by exceeding the current, a kilowatt out of a pair of them. It was recommended that connections to the plate be made with a heat sink and a flexible wire to allow for this thing to expand. In amateur service, especially with home-built amplifiers, it was not unusual to have a fan stock, a fan stock connector. This one's not quite big enough to make the plate connection. This is a GL446. Uh, this particular one was made by General Electric. And this is commonly referred to as a lighthouse tube, probably because somebody imagines it's a lighthouse. The actual working parts of this tube are about as far apart as my fingernails, probably a lot closer. The anode or the plate is a steel cylinder that comes down and stops somewhere down in there, perfectly flat on the bottom. The cathode is indirectly heated by a filament. It's a flat round plate. And between the two is the control grid. This is a triode. And this ring is the uh, grid connection. And this metal plate top hat is the anode or plate connection. From here down it's just uh, the cathode and the, the filament. It's called a planar tube. P-L-N-A-R because everything happens at a plane. Now a lot of vacuum tubes that I've shown you plate or the anode is wrapped around and it's built up in cylindrical pieces. A plate, a screen, a control grid, and a cathode. Here's a cross section of the tube. It comes down here to a plate that's the anode. The grid mesh is in between, and the top of this member is the cathode. So it's the plate is a disc, the cathode is a disc, and the grid is a disc formation of mesh. The intention was to install this in a cavity. You plug the tube in and then the cavity came down over the top. A circular ring in the cavity made connection with the grid. A plunger came down at the same time 
made this connection and a much bigger one made the cathode connection. If you can imagine this tube is in this cavity. The tube is here. It only goes up that high. This, this is the springy plate connector. This is a round piece of pipe like that makes a connection with a grid. And then this is the cathode connection. This cavity is tuned, and you can see it was designed as a, this particular one is a, a mixer. Signal comes in, local oscillator comes in, and the intermediate frequency output is taken here. Okay? They also used the same kind of thing as an amplifier for low level signals. Particularly, it was developed during the war, World War II, and it was used for radar receivers. So consequently, there's not a whole bunch of information about this except in some physics books. Most of these were obsolete by the end of World War II, or if they weren't obsolete, they were secret. GL446, a lighthouse tube. I would be remiss in doing a series on vacuum tubes and not mentioning the new Vista. The new Vista is a vacuum tube, well a whole series of vacuum tubes, uh, released by RCA the end of 1950, the beginning of 1960. In the early 60s, we saw a lot of these in televisions, uh, some stereos, some test equipment. Uh, Tektronics made an oscilloscope with ex exclusive of these new visitors. And I believe Ampex made a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that use new visitors. These are metal encased tubes uh, and they're socketed. These two protruding flanges, one's wider than the other. Because these are little wire pins, certainly the pins can't be used to locate. You, you, you bend the pins. So the socket accepts these wide and narrow flanges. So before the pins can even engage in the so socket surface, you have to rotate the Nevister so that these fall in the perimeter cuts on the socket. The socket actually passes beyond this flange a little bit. So it two seats to about the dimension of my fingernail. The socket itself is that as deep as these flanges. I'm not sure if anybody else other than RCA actually manufactured these. Um, the reason I say that is it's very complicated to build a factory for these. Uh, glass tubes can be assembled in the open air and then they're evacuated once the tube is encased in glass. And then the evacuation port is heated and pulls itself shut by the action of the vacuum. These have no vacuum port on them. They were actually assembled in a high vacuum container robotically. Um, all the rest of the vacuum tubes I know about were assembled by hand, usually hundreds of women, uh, very nimble fingered. Most of the new Vistas had this envelope package, and this particular one is a 6CW4. It's a triode, and almost every one of these I ran into was a 6CW4. The other package 
is this, which is identical to the uh, standard package until we get up to about here. Then we've got a ceramic disc, here it is, and then we have a metal cap. Now in a, a glass tube, the metal cap is usually uh, stuck on top. It's, it's a plate connection. And it's a powered. In, when you see a tube, a glass tube, with a connection to the top, it's generally a power tube. This was not especially a power tube. This is a 7587, which is a tetrode. A 6CW4 is a triode. Now, the tetrode has a, a screen element interposed between the control grid and the plate. And that serves to reduce capacity between the plate and the uh, control grid. So a tetrode has by design of the vacuum tube less capacitance between the control grid and here. In this tube, now it's a triode, the plate is located at the top but it's brought down inside the metal enclosure to one of these pins. That lead length introduces inner electrode capacitance. Here we can make connection to the filament cathode control voltage to the uh, connection to the control grid and connection to the tetrode or screen grid here. Here we can make connections to the plate. So this layout further decreases control grid to plate uh, capacitance. I don't believe I ever replaced one of these. But I did uh, tune a broadband amplifier with some of these in it. And the amplifier had uh, a steel barrier right here between each stage to reduce capacity coupling from this end to this end. Now the barrier had a fairly big opening in it because you had to remove the tetrode if you ever had occasion to replace it. These disappeared from new equipment in somewhere in the 70s and they were manufactured, I think, into the 80s. Mostly, as I said, by RCA, but I've, you've seen tubes, new vistas. Well, they look identical to new vistas, they're interchangeable. But Mark Mullard, I don't know if Mullard actually made them or if they rebranded RCA tubes. These had a very short service duty. They were released in competition with the uh, transistor. But they have some historical interest to people that are interested in vacuum tubes.